It's a beautiful Saturday here in Oceanside, California, in North San Diego County. I've been wanting to tell the story of Musomorphic for a while, and it's way bigger than a TED Talk. So I thought I'd put that down for posterity and hopefully uh, to inspire you to want to think more carefully about the music that you love and how you can use that. So here's how it all began. I'm at a piano recital. Remember those? They don't happen too much anymore, but all the parents and kids gather around and the kids who have prepared music go to the piano one by one and they play for everybody and everybody claps appreciatively. Even if, like me, you had a whole bunch of clams, it's still the best thing that ever happened. These days, it's all recorded on video cameras and we have you know, embarrassing moments to look back on. The moment I want to share with you, however, was not embarrassing. It happened at the farewell recital of my first piano teacher after my mother. The teacher's name is Sarah, Sarah Rockabrand. And in Palo Alto in the mid-60s, all of us gathered together in a beautiful home with a big grand piano to share the music that we'd been preparing for probably many months in most cases. My parents were there. Sarah, our teacher, of course, was there. And this was a special moment because it was sort of Sarah's retirement party. Her husband, Bob, had just got his doctorate in music from Stanford University. And Sarah and Bob were going to move away back to her home state, as it turns out, so that he could start a career there uh, teaching in college. So all of us were there to uh, share our music and to say farewell to Sarah. I wasn't a really accomplished piano player back then. And usually the way these recitals work is that the further you get into the program, the more complicated and accomplished the piano players are. But I was last that day. And after everyone else had played, it was my turn. And I went to the piano, sat down and played a very simplified version of a beautiful melody. It's the Largo from Dvorak's New World Symphony. There are so many beautiful recordings of this, including one by Yo-Yo Ma, where he plays a very reduced version of the melody on the cello. He recorded it during COVID. The symphony was written long before this melody was extracted and given words, which was a popular thing to do in the 1900s. Lots of classical melodies got turned into popular songs. And the words to this one are, going home, going home, I'm going home. Now, I didn't know that as a six or seven-year-old, as I sat there that day and played my little simplified reduction of this melody from the New World Symphony. But when I finished and stood at the piano and bowed as we're taught to do and looked over at Sarah, she was smiling and clapping, just like all the parents, appreciative. But there was something else happening. Big tears were coming down her face. As a little kid, I didn't know what that meant, but it stuck with me. And it stuck with me in a way that, well, even now, some 50 plus years later, I'm still exploring and investigating. The big question that hit me that day was, how can someone be happy and sad at the same time? But it's become a bigger question. Why did the music create that moment of happiness and sadness combined together in one face, the face of my teacher? Roll forward a few years, and I'd become a pretty decent piano player playing Bach and Beethoven and things like that. But, you know, classical music is not a lot of fun. You're inside at the piano while your friends are outside playing touch football or riding bikes on the trails out in the mountains behind our houses. But there I was, working hard at the piano and not really enjoying it. One afternoon, I was digging through mom's stacks of sheet music, and I found a piece of sheet music called the 12th Street Rag. I didn't know what a rag was. And on the cover was a guy holding a trombone. Well, I knew what a trombone was because mom had taken me to a lot of symphony performances. And I could see them in the back there with these big slides. They were fascinating because unlike other instruments, the instrument actually changed shape as the person who was playing it played it. So this caught my eye. And I opened the music and it didn't look too difficult. So I thought, well, you know what? I can learn to play this and just see what it's like to play something completely different than any classical music that I know. 
It took a while, but I eventually got it. Now, in our family at that time, we didn't have any recordings of the 12th Street Rag. And the internet, of course, wasn't around in the 60s and 70s. So I had no idea what this piece was supposed to sound like. At the school where I was going at the time, we had these award ceremonies. It was a private school and it was small, maybe a couple hundred students. And every six weeks or so, there'd be an award ceremony for academic achievement and uh, honor and things like that. It was sort of a military-ish kind of school. And talented students would recite a poem or dance or play the piano or other instruments at these award ceremonies. And you could volunteer to be on the program. Well, I volunteered. And I didn't tell anybody what I was going to play. Didn't have to. The big day arrived, of course, and all of us were packed into this large, it was an, the school was in an old mansion in this large room from the littlest at the front to the oldest at the back. And my name was called and I went to the piano. Now the piano is one of those sawed off upright pianos, you know, that was just a little bit taller than, uh, than a, uh, about a third or fourth grade student. So I was in fifth grade. So I was a little bit taller than the piano by that time. And it was facing the wall. So I sat down with my back to everybody at this sawed off spinet and began to play the 12th Street Rag. Now, I learned a lot later that 12th Street Rag actually goes pretty fast. But the way I was playing it, it sounded very much more like sort of a slow drag. There's an introduction, and I played that. And then I started into the main theme itself. You all know this theme. It's a Louis Armstrong has a famous recording at that tempo. And there are others, of course, including Jelly Roll Morton's, which is one of the amazing feats of piano, piano virtuosity that ever exists. You can hear that online now. But that was me in fifth grade. So I played the first strain. And when I got all done, of course, it ends with a crash. And before I could start the second strain, everybody started to applaud. Well, I'm a classically trained pianist, right? So I know what to do when people applaud in the wrong place. You just keep going. And that's what I did. And everybody quieted down, of course, as I started the second strain. Well, the second strain ends in a very similar way to the first strain. And when it ended, everybody began to clap again. Now, at this point, something had started to occur to me. You see, I knew something that they didn't know. I knew that the 12th Street Rag had one more strain and that they'd have to clap for me one more time at the end of that strain. So, with this knowledge in mind and a dawning awareness that there was something going on that was more than the music in the room, I launched into the third strain. And of course, when it was over, everybody kind of waited to find out if I was going to play anything more. I didn't, and they clapped. And it was a beautiful moment of understanding for me to realize that music is about the conversation between the musicians and the people who are listening. There was some synchrony in that particular date and time, too, because shortly after the 12th Street Rag uh, event in my life, a movie called The Sting came out with Robert Redford and Paul Newman and music by Scott Joplin. Ragtime became popular again, and for a short time anyway. You could actually hear it on AM radio in the San Francisco Bay Area. The Sting launched pieces like the Maple Leaf Rag and the Entertainer, which is probably the most popular piece people will remember from the Sting, and an interest in Scott Joplin that way, want, went way beyond songs like Solace and the Easy Winners and the Pineapple Rag, and even, <laughs> even into other ragtime composers. And along the way, there was Bill a pianist who was a novelty now at parties because he could play Rachmaninoff and Ragtime. Roll forward a few years from that, after college, and I'm thinking to myself, you know what, the life of a classical piano player can be a grind. You do very little else but perform and practice, and it's 90-10 when it comes to performing practice. You get to perform about 10% of the time if you're lucky and practice about 90% of the time. That wasn't really for me. But I did have something, and I did have something of a gift, and I wanted to share it. And so I began to reach out 
and play in unusual places. Uh, retirement homes, of course, are a good one. Uh, I look for places where people wouldn't normally find a guy in a tuxedo and a grand piano playing for them. And of course, along the way, I did a stint at Nordstrom. Yes, Nordstrom had grand pianos back in the day. And got to work with some amazing people in memory care. Yes, memory care. This was around the time that a documentary was being made called Alive Inside. And the music therapists who made this documentary wanted to demonstrate that by putting music together with a person who had no other effect, basically sitting almost comatose, they could re-enliven, re-engage that person with memories, even with faculties that wouldn't have existed without music. And they demonstrate this in the movie, and you can watch it. It's available on YouTube. Where someone who was basically sitting head down, almost asleep in a chair, is given music, and this guy wakes up. He just wakes up, and you can see expression on his face, and he begins to communicate and talk. And this is someone in the advanced stage of Alzheimer's who is able to reconnect in the moment thanks to the music that was inside him. That music essentially brought him back to a joyful experience of life. Well, I got to work with people who are caregivers for people in memory care. Caregivers need a lot of help. They have no respite. And being able to communicate in some way with those that they're caring for, often a family member, gives them a bridge that they wouldn't have any other way. And even offering a performance in that space and allowing the cared for and the caregiver to share the musical experience together is an improvement over not having had that. And this is very, very early on. Uh, neuroscience had just become a thing back then, and music as a stimulus for neuroscientific experiments had just become a thing. We could measure that back then. So I wasn't really on the leading edge of science, but I was on the leading edge of practical application with people in memory care. Out of that experience grew uh, an actual performance, an actual show, a one-man show that I called for the love of music. And I was privileged to be able to give it a number of places. I have a file cabinet full of all of the recitals or performances, depending on how you look at it, that took place. Offering people who wouldn't normally hear music a chance to experience it. What music did I use? Combination. Everything from jazz to classical to ragtime to Dixieland to even improvised modern music some gospel, a variety of music to try to reach everyone in the room with something that they could resonate for, something they could resonate with. For the Love of Music premiered in a little tiny town in West Cliff, Colorado, up in the Sangre de Cristo uh, mountains in, in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And I was privileged to do it there a number of times. When it came time to become more actively involved with people in need of music. A therapist that I was working with suggested that I work with traumatized veterans. And that work sort of overflowed into working with homeless people and other at-risk audiences. I had some preparation for this, thanks to an experience that came near and dear to my heart, a very personal experience. I had been in trauma therapy for a while, and uh, being on psych meds is one of the ways that you can adjust so that the symptoms don't overwhelm your ability to deal with them and sort of integrate with them. Uh, the SSRIs I was using weren't really helpful for that. And with counsel and guidance, of course, with a therapist and a psychiatrist, I made the decision to stop taking uh, the one that I was using and sort of go cold turkey into the experience of. Um, awareness without guardrails, shall we say. There was a moment in life where that became a very poignant experience for me. And it was a moment where I was preparing for yet another performance of For the Love of Music. It was an interesting program, and I'd gotten myself into a place where a very special song to me, a, a song that um, was written ages ago by Rachmaninoff, Piano Solo, it's an etude tableau, and people have given it the name Seagulls, I think because of its sort of 
oceanic quality. If you hear the music, you can see yourself standing on a beach on a gray day with a low tide and seagulls whirling in the clouds up above you. It's that kind of an atmosphere. It's an unusual piece for Rachmaninoff. Most of the things he wrote don't sound like new age piano music, but this one does. And it found me many, many years before where I was couch surfing and a clock radio woke me up. I thought it was classical music, but it sounded like new age. We didn't have the internet, so it took me a while to learn what it was. And I did. And then it even took me longer to learn it, which I eventually did. And at one point, I played it for a senior recital when I graduated from University of California, Irvine. It's a beautiful piece. It's very moving. And it's not dark, but it is melancholy. It does take you to a deep place. And I had programmed this particular piece into my For the Love of Music program that was uh, supposed to be premiering uh, maybe only a couple of weeks away. Trouble was, I couldn't figure out how to recover. I couldn't figure out how to turn the corner after this amazing piece of Rachmaninoff onto something else. And so I was stuck trying to make my way into the second or maybe the, the last third of the program. At the time, I had a home in the hills uh, up in Idlewild, California, and a condo down near the beach in Laguna Niguel. I was living there because my kid had been molested by their stepfather. And I had to provide for their safety and their continuity of their education until they finished high school. And so having the two homes, which was a financial stretch, was important for the continuity of my kid's education. Early in the summer, just after graduation, my kid came to me and um, one of the most remarkable conversations I've had in my life came out to me. And if you're a parent and you've ever had a child come out to you. Uh, it is such a beautiful and moving experience. And I am so, so grateful for Kendall's honesty and courage to be able to do that. That was a very moving thing because shortly after, in fact, within a couple of months, Kendall was off to college. And I would essentially be at that moment an empty nester. That empty nest is where Late one afternoon, the Friday before Labor Day, I found myself sitting in my rented condo, looking out over this beautiful valley in Laguna Niguel as the sun was setting behind me. The shadows got longer and longer in the valley. And as I began to contemplate my moment in life, the shadows got longer and longer for me too. Both my kids were now in school. My second marriage had ended in divorce shortly before Kendall had come out to me. I was facing bankruptcy. And it seemed like choosing the next song for my coming recital was one of the few things that offered me a, a forward direction at that moment. I decided at that time just to sit and be with the music. And the music that I chose to mind me was this Rachmaninoff etude tableau. I wanted to let it work on me and see what it would reveal. I knew a little bit about music at that point and what it could do. And I wanted to offer myself the opportunity to see if it could bring me the kind of transformation that I wanted. So I put on my headphones, the over-the-ear kind grabbed my iPod, put the song on repeat, and sat in a comfortable chair and watched the sunset. And it got darker outside, and it got darker inside. I had struggled for most of my life with suicidal ideation, and to be in that dark place with intent was new for me. I didn't feel like I had control or agency, but I felt like I had something to hold on to as I took the dark journey to see what would come for me. And a dark journey it was. As it got darker outside, I began to weep. There's so much inside of us that we hold in there. And like a lot of guys who come from those, you know, come on guys, hold it together, stiff upper lip it, you know, that kind of family. 
I'd learned to keep a lot inside. I didn't release all of it that night, but a lot of it came up and a lot of it left me as the tears began to flow. It's an ineffable moment to be able to describe the specifics of what happens when that experience reaches us. But I can tell you that the music helped. It began to sort of reach in and pull out those things that needed to go. And the melodies and the way that the piece is sort of, it's, it's structured in two against three, for those of you who are musical, it kind of limps along in a way. It's not broken, but it's also not really free-flowing. And that herky-jerky nature of the music, combined with the beautiful melody that Rachmaninoff created for it, were enough to give me that experience, that twosome experience that Sarah had back in the day, where two emotions were in place at one time. The sadness, of course, overwhelming. And also the sort of purposeful release, the, the willingness to stay with it until something had happened. There's lots of sort of allegorical representations of that in the wisdom literature. In college, I had done a study of Jacob's transformation to become Israel. And the wrestling match that goes on with Jacob is analogous to the experience that I was having that evening. There are many more of these kinds of heroic journeys that exist in the literature, and there's plenty of plenty of discussion and wisdom literature out there as well as reflection on them. And since that time, even though I felt like I was dealing with a suicidal intervention on my own, I think the more accurate way to characterize it is that I was taking a heroic journey on my own, a shadow journey, doing deep shadow work. Since that time, I've learned that there are a lot of musicians who are adept at the psychedelic journey and that that being able to let go of one's ego and allow the connection to unity consciousness to take place is something that can be achieved through music as well as through psychedelics. I wasn't in unity consciousness that night, that's for sure. I was in agony. But I understand the power of music to take us to that place and to be able to connect us with something that's more ineffable than science can give us, let's say, for now. I'll return to that a little bit later. At one point, I think I fell asleep. And I woke hours later in the chair with the music still in my, my ears, feeling completely exhausted, wrung out in every possible way. No more thoughts, no room for any more emotion, completely physically drained and spiritually empty. I took myself to bed and slept very soundly until dawn woke me. And with the dawn, something else was going on. As I often do, I had words in my head. And the words began to form themselves into something that had structure. Rather than just the chatter, the background chatter of our head brains, I was getting actual rhyming stanzas. And I grabbed some paper because I realized that this was something I should probably pay attention to. And I wrote down what was coming to me. And before long, I had three verses and a bridge. And I realized I was writing song lyrics. And there was a moment where I, they felt complete. And I said to myself, well, this is great. Now I've got this song. Um, I'm accustomed to writing poetry. I can do that. And it wasn't great poetry. You know, it wasn't even, uh, I felt really that great lyrics. But I said aloud to myself, what in the world is this? And where is the music for this song? And right away, the words in my head were replaced with music, with a melody, with chords, with a beat. It had structure and form, and it fit the words. And I quickly went to the uh, keyboard and grabbed the tiny little version of what we now use as music composition software, 
and started to transcribe what I was hearing in my head. And it wasn't long uh, before I had the whole song, words, music, and the whole thing right there on the computer in front of me. And again, I said out loud, well, this is great, but who will ever sing this? And the words, I could hear them as clear as day in the room, as if someone were there standing and talking to me, said, Bill, you are. And suddenly it hit me that what had happened was that I had somehow been given the song that was to turn the corner from that beautiful Rachmaninoff etude tableau into the last bit of the program that I was supposed to perform in a few weeks. Well, I learned my song. And I performed it a few times. I don't know how many times I did that show. It was a handful, but I did it each time. Shocked people in the audience who had never heard me sing before. I probably won't be singing any more since. But what a revelation to be that open and in that place. And to accept the challenge that came from that heroic journey. To do something I had never done and make it a part of something that was very, very important and dear to me, the performance of Fuerta Lava Music. With that trauma story, I came to San Diego, California, and began to volunteer to work with veterans. Post-traumatic stress was a new thing back then. I mean, it's been around a while, but we were calling it post-traumatic stress, and people were able to talk about it, and the stigma was begin, had begun to be released. And I got involved with a nonprofit called Guitars for Vets, which had actual research to prove that playing the guitar reduces the symptoms of post traumatic stress. It's a truly wonderful not for profit. It exists in America. I don't think it exists in the rest of the world. But the work that has gone on with Guitars for Vets since 2010 has been amazing. And many veterans have found relief from the symptoms of post traumatic stress. I helped Guitars for Vets to launch a few chapters, and we actually had a multi-chapter performance for Yamaha Corporation, who sponsored us with guitars. Uh, it, it was a beautiful experience that continues. Not a music therapist, but in the process of that, I discovered that music therapists were working with veterans as well, and doing things like starting veterans bands, and helping veterans who were challenged in some way uh, physically to be able to play instruments in spite of whatever disability they might have uh, have experienced. We had an, in San Diego, for example, we had a guy who could play guitar with his feet. He had no arms. He was amazing. Working with that community was such a privilege, and it opened out into other at-risk communities too, the recovery community, the homeless community. And I was happy to work for 10 years, actually, volunteer for an organization that served homeless people. Part of that beautiful ride resulted in a national award from the National Council for Behavioral Health in 2014. Partly for the work that I do and partly for having survived my own life, I think. Being a trauma survivor, I think, is a commonality we all have. Trauma is a part of our life. And how we respond to it is a big part of our growth. The research around post-traumatic stress has now sort of evolved into research around post-traumatic growth, where trauma itself is looked at as not a wall, but a doorway. This is a very similar thing to what the ancient Greek Stoics were finding. Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus welcomed traumatic experience as a doorway to something more. And if this ties into the work of Carl Jung and any of the other uh, psychologists out there who have explored the shadow journey, or to any of the exploration of the shadow journey that you can find in wisdom literature or in the movies, you may recognize for yourself that extreme trauma is actually what helps propel us toward growth that we need. I was so inspired by this work that I decided to form a company to carry it on, to promote the music as self-care modality that I felt was so important for people back then. Watching guitars and veterans change post-traumatic stress symptoms together with no need for meds or a psychotherapist or even a music therapist. It's something you do for yourself. 
really inspired me. And so I formed a company called Music Care. Turns out, the Recording Academy of the Arts and Sciences here in Los Angeles has a not-profit organization that takes care of musician members that are down on their luck and need medical or financial assistance. The organization that they founded is called Music Cares. MusicCares.org serves many musicians every year, and especially during the COVID pandemic, was able to help lots of musicians who needed financial and healthcare assistance. I didn't think that being Music Care Incorporated was a problem. And around the world, there are perhaps a dozen companies that are named Music Care, including a music therapy organization in France, a foundation in Canada that teaches people like you and me, regular folks, how to do palliative care with music, and several others. But when I filed for a trademark for Music Care, the Grammy organization decided that they'd had enough. And even though I was probably a musician that they would have cared for in regular times, they were going to force me to change my company name. I don't have a problem with that, because between 2010 and, say, 2020, the idea of music and care had become too small. There's so much more to music than self-care. And as I progressed down this course of study, which I'll share with you next, I discovered that just fixing things, just intervening for things, even things as big as traumatic stress, was not the sole purpose of music, that there was so much more it could do. So while it was a hard and expensive journey, transforming music care into musimorphic was a necessary phase of development, shall we say, for yours truly. And now that we have Musimorphic, there's so much more we can do because we're not locked in simply to clinical care or even to psychological care or even to self care because music operates in so many ways physically, mentally, emotionally, even spiritually. Let's talk about that for just a minute how music really works. You've all probably been present where there was a drum of some kind, where there was a beat. The amazing kick drums that we can record now. Can you imagine if the Beatles had had the same technology recording, the, recording their sessions that we can use now? It would have been a totally different experience. But that beat, that wonderful beat, works on us. It works on us physically. With a beat, you can do what's called entrainment. If you were to set up two metronomes, you know, those things that click, and they've done experiments on this, and you were having them click in different ways, eventually the, the metronomes would come into synchrony. They would entrain to each other and click in unison. Our heartbeat does that. When there's a drum in the room, it's automatic. The autonomous, autonomic nervous system syncs up to a drum. It can also sync up to a click track, and I've used that. Before a meeting, I'll often have a little click going on my phone. It doesn't have to be a drum beat. could be just a click. And it's loud enough that people can hear but not really tune into. And having that click at a tempo that I choose helps everybody sort of come to the same place in the room. Don't have to say anything, don't have to announce what's going on. And when everybody's seated, I simply turn it off. Little trick you can use, power of music. But other things in train too. Our breath can be entrained by a beat without having to provide any instructions. Our heartbeat can entrain to a beat without having to provide any instructions. When you know this about the beat or the click, it can become a powerful thing. Just like I use that in the room to bring everybody onto the same page, to bring them physically into alignment, so can you. You can use that in your family. 
You can use that at the office. You probably already use that if you do any kind of physical activity. And now that you know, you'll probably use it more. But there's something else going on. It's more than entrainment. You see that beat can get into our brainstem. Why would that be important? Well, the last time you were in a club, you probably recognized that you weren't there for any kind of intellectual activity, right? The music is loud, it's noisy, there's lots of people. Nobody's thinking about balancing their checkbook. Well, maybe they might be thinking about it, but that's not really the intellectual level of the room. It's much more fundamental. It's much more fight, flee, freeze, feed, or, well, mate. The famous five Fs, isn't it? And that's brainstem stuff. That's the lizard brain or the crocodile brain or whatever you want to call it. It's not the cerebral cortex going on in a club. It's something else. And the beat is a wonderful way to entrain to those fight, flee, freeze, feed, or, or mate uh, impulses, shall we call them? Maybe choices. You don't even have to think about it. You can let it happen. And often time it, times it does, right? Why do we have singles bars? Just saying. That's part of what the beat does. And you can use that. DJs do this all the time, right? You've got your beat. You can change the tempo, upregulate or downregulate, faster or slower. It's a marvelous power. And now that you know about it, you can use it too. But that's just physical. And I know I've been talking about the brain, but there's more that can go on in the brain. And we'll get to that in a moment, because the second thing that I want to cover here is the emotional side of what happens to us with music. Now, when you're in fight, flee, freeze, feed, or mate, there are feelings associated with that. And those feelings are kind of like the next level up from that physical brainstem layer. The emotions that come to us. now. There are four basic ones, although the science of emotion is really blowing up. So if you read Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart, for example, you'll discover 87 experiences and emotions that she's cataloged in the research. But let's keep it simple for now and talk about just four. What are they? Anger, fear, sadness, and joy. And of course, there are different levels of anger, fear, sadness, and joy. That night in the chair, I was feeling melancholy, and eventually it got into deep grief. So my sadness deepened from a lower level to a more intense one. Same thing with anger. You can be a little bit afraid, or you can be jumping over your seat in a movie theater with terror. Two different kinds of fear. Same with anger. Same with joy. Joy can range from contentment all the way up to ecstasy. If you're tracking with me here, you can also realize that music can play with those different levels of the four basic emotions. Scary music has always been a thing. We understand as musicians how music will work on an audience. And if we're composers, we choose music that will work in a way that we want the audience to feel. Classical composers are very adept with this. So are people who score for movies. They really understand how to use the music to get the emotional response that they want. And of course, because emotions and our physical responses, our brainstem responses are, are tied so closely together, you can work at that level as a musician to be able not only to get the heartbeat entrained, the breath entrained, but you can also get the emotions that you want to join that entrainment, which can be an almost overwhelming experience specifically when you're in the movie theater and you wind up jumping over your chair with fright at the right moment. Sound is a big part of that. But you know what? Emotions are also tied to melody. With a beat, you can produce an entrainment, but with melody, you can lead the entrained person where you want them to go. You can take them high, you can take them low. You can give them moments of breath where they're in, in anticipation of what will happen next when the melody stops for just a moment. 
and then you can lead them on. You can make them go fast, you can make them go slow. Melody is able to take the emotional control that the beat unlocks and move those emotions into a journey that the listeners can share. Now, let's talk about the head. We love the head. The head brain has been the source of our fascination since, well, since the Age of Enlightenment. Although way back in those ancient Greek days, they were into reason too. So people have been thinking about thinking for a long time. And of course, we can't process music without it. I mentioned the gentleman in Alive Inside whose Alzheimer's had limited his brain to such an extent that he wasn't able to do normal things until music unlocked it for him. So how does music work on the brain? How does it unlock what's in the brain? Well, when I got started on this, we didn't know much. And that was, I mean, seriously starting in the 80s and 90s. We didn't know too much. We know a great deal more now, thanks to modern neuroscience and social neuroscience, which allows us to see interactions between people's neurology, if you will. And I remember a time when David Letterman interviewed the one and only Dr. Oliver Sacks, and functional MRI was new back then. And Dr. Sacks was on Letterman with a couple of interesting brain scans uh, in color that he was showing. And it was, it was marvelous because he was able to demonstrate his preference for Bach versus Beethoven. The scan, which had been done in beautiful color, of Dr. Sachs's brain on Bach was lit up all kinds of colors. And the one in, that was Dr. Sachs listening to Beethoven had much less uh, color and light to it. And the inter interpretation we had for that was, at least in the cerebral cortex, that Dr. Sachs's personal preference for Bach was reflected in the functional MRI of his brain. Which, of course, we were all fascinated by that back in the day. And uh, for what, as much as we know, uh, we can say, well, yes, that's true. Current understanding is that we are able to show a preference for one composer versus another in terms of how that music lights up our brain. This has nothing to do with whether the music is more complex. It has everything to do with personal preference. And I do want to get back to personal preference soon because that's, according to the research, one of the most powerful features that we have and current understanding about music is that the music you love is your most powerful music. But back to the brain. So there's lots of things to talk about here. Um, the brain responds to frequency. And there are many, many arguments these days about what frequencies are the best ones to use. Uh, 432 hertz and the solfeggio tones. And we have research that shows that listening to 40 hertz helps for memory care and slows down the spread of Alzheimer's and dementia. But in the day when Oliver Sacks went on Letterman, what we knew about the brain and music was contained in a book by a guy named Campbell who had written the one and only Mozart effect. Yes, the Mozart effect. Don Campbell um, was a music educator back in the day, and he noticed that kids in his choir program um, who had had classical music training were somewhat brighter than kids who hadn't. And he did a yeoman's job of anecdotal evidence gathering and uh, released this book called The Mozart Effect, which created quite a stir on both sides of the aisle. Some believed that it was true and got classical music lessons for their kids right away, and others poo-pooed it, particularly scientists at the time. I happened to be working with some research scientists at the University of California, Irvine, who were doing um, work with IQ and brain stuff. And they said, oh, you know, the Mozart effect, it isn't Mozart at all. It's just high frequencies, high pitched sounds, like with birdsong, you get the same IQ effect. And they should know because their, their job was producing a drug, actually, that boosted IQ. So they had to know what the mechanisms were. Well, needless to say, the Mozart effect has survived. It's since been released, re-released, and co-authored. But along the way, a, a music producer turned neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Daniel Levitin, released a book called This Is Your Brain on Music, which gave us all that we knew at the time, uh, in the mid-2000s or so, about how the brain responds to music. And it is, in a way, very interesting to know that music doesn't reach the cerebral cortex first. When we hear music, 
in our ears, the eardrums, send signals first to the lower parts of the brain, the animal parts of the brain. It takes several hundred milliseconds longer to get to the cerebral cortex, which is why the startle reflex works so well. When you jump over your seat backwards in a movie theater when you're scared, what's happened there is the part of you that hears the sounds is responding and your physical body takes over way before the mental thinking part of you realizes that it's, oh, it's just a movie, right? There's no need to be scared. But by that time, it's too late. The effect has already happened. So the part of the brain that we're talking about right now is the part that is uh, way behind the physical responses, the way behind the emotional responses uh, in terms of time that it takes for the brain to understand and process what's going on. So all of those things that happen to us, whether they're a frequency, a monofrequency, or an actual piece of music, are things that we think about after we've already had the response. And this is one of the big insights in Dr. Levitin's book. Another big insight from his book is that it doesn't so much matter that we hear the sound, because sounds that we remember, music that we remember, has the same physiological effect on us as sounds that we hear. Now, isn't that interesting? So if the cerebral cortex or whatever part of our brain is reminding us of the music, begins to play that music for us. That is an, an initial trigger to what? The brainstem, to the lower fight, flight, freeze, feed, or yes, that part of the brain. And then it becomes something that we think about. So memory, nostalgia, is a pretty important way for us to connect back into that music and let it work on us. Remember I said earlier that the most powerful music is the music that we love? Yeah, it is, because it's in there. It's in the thinker, and it's in the rememberer, and it's in the experiencer of that. The physical, the emotional experiencer of that music we remember is there too. Now, I don't know if you remember music in 432 hertz, or if you can remember a 40 hertz tone, or if your head brain is capable of reminding you of what it's like to feel any of the seven or eight, or maybe nine now, solfeggio tones. I don't think that's what matters. What matters is that you can remember anything that is musical and respond to it. That amazing beat, you can remember a song like that, right? You can remember the love song that brought you alive emotionally. You can remember songs that are intellectually stimulating too. Lots of people like to say that Mozart is intellectually stimulating, and it turns out that a lot of classical music can have an intellectually stimulating effect on us. For some of us, and for others of us, it's other music that has that intellectual stimulation. I know people who love the intellectual stimulation in metal. That's totally cool, right? Because that's what does it for them. So, bring it on, right? Does it change their IQ? Oh, does it matter? <laughs> if it helps them to become intellectually more acute, that's the right music to use, particularly if it's already in there and they can call it up. Because the moment that you remember that music, thank you, rememberer, it has that effect on you. It has the physical effect, the emotional effect, the mental effect. Bang, it's all right there. And it has one more very intriguing effect as well, because music, it turns out, also works on, on us in ways that science hasn't yet been able to identify. We can measure some of the effects, of course, but predicting the, let's say, the spiritual effect of music, science is not quite there yet. Our current understanding will recognize that something has happened, but it's not predictive. Well, you say, but Bill, I know people who listen to metal music all the time, and they always get that spiritual effect. Well, why do you think they listen to metal music, right? But this is holistic. This is holistic. I like to say that it is mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, MEPS, M-E-P-S. And the beautiful thing about music is that it's not exclusive. You can go at music for a mental purpose and get the emotional, physical, and the spiritual too. You can go at music for a spiritual purpose, worship in church, and get all the other effects as well, the mental, the emotional, the physical. It's one of the most beautiful things about the power of music, that it is holistic and does work on all four aspects of our being. 
So let's talk for a, just a minute about the spiritual aspects of music. We all know what soft skills are, right? Things like compassion and empathy, authenticity, the stuff that doesn't result in an immediate bottom line. Think for just a second about the music that helps you be more loving, music that helps you be more compassionate. If you're a parent and you've ever sung a lullaby to a child who's falling asleep, you'll have some idea of what this means. If you've ever had a love song sung to you, you'll have some idea of what this means, this spiritual aspect of music. The stuff that is not necessarily mental, even though we can think about it happening. The stuff that is not necessarily emotional, even though it does warm our heart in many ways sometimes. The stuff that is not necessarily physical, even though we can feel ourselves coming to peace, coming to ground, when music that creates a profound effect on us is playing in the room. The spiritual aspects of music also include things like my piano teacher, Sarah, laughing and crying at the same moment. We know that that's possible. Scientifically, we can understand how that works. But why does it happen? What is the purpose? A wise friend of mine likes to say that when you have both sides of a paradox, and sometimes there are more, paradoxes can have multiple true aspects all simultaneously present. But at the moment of paradox, there's an invitation. The invitation is not to go left or not to go right. It's the path that diverges in the wood and has a third way that isn't apparent. Maybe it is the third way that was less traveled by. But when you have a paradox, you have a spiritual invitation. You have an invitation to do work in a way that doesn't add to the left and doesn't add to the right and doesn't carry you in either direction, but instead carries you maybe up, maybe forward where no one has gone, but certainly in a way that is different from what you might expect. And if there's anything we can say that characterizes the spiritual, it's that the spiritual is different than what you might expect. Poets and wisdom teachers, artists, sculptors, certainly musicians, have a burden of finding that new way, of being able to combine the elements of their art so that we, the listeners or the viewers or the experiencers, can understand that there is something else going on beyond the beat, beyond the melody, beyond the frequencies. That other thing, that's the spiritual thing. Now, some might call that consciousness, and I'm good with consciousness because it's just as ineffable as spirituality. Some might call that experience of Otherness, the pan egoic self or unity consciousness. The amazing thing about this spiritual aspect of music, though, is that it isn't something that comes from out there. One of the most beautiful wisdom teachers ever in the world, and he wasn't the only one, by the way, pointed out that what he called the kingdom, the kingdom of God is within you. This is a very Eastern concept, too. Uh, finding within. Finding one's spiritual answers within. Being willing to take the Jungian shadow journey, if that's what it takes. Going within. Joining me that night in the chair with Rachmaninoff. That kind of journey. That's the spiritual journey that is the invitation in music. And believe it or not, as powerful as we all think music is right now, music is even more powerful on that journey, that spiritual journey. I've all, I know we're all sort of untethered right now from religiosity and church. It's okay. It's okay. Because as long as music is in the room, we still have at least one foot 
in the realm of the spiritual. And that's enough. It's enough, actually, to start a movement. The movement that I want to invite you to, to join me with right now is the musomorphic movement. It's not about subscriptions. It's not about selling you anything. It's about reminding you of something that's very fundamental to who we all are as human beings about something that's way more fundamental than some shaman giving you some miracle cure or some secret wisdom. It's something that's way more fundamental than a sound healer offering you frequencies and tones to move you along. It's something way more fundamental than sitting with a guru during meditation. It's way more fundamental even than any of the exercises or the lotions and potions or any of the things that are out there. It's way more powerful than mystics or healers because it's yours. It's within you. And you don't need somebody else to give it to you. What you need is a movement that supports your own ability to unlock that thing and to put it to work. And that is the musomorphic movement, the movement that you're invited to join right now. Let's talk about music that moves us. I love the fact that music moves us. Perhaps it's maybe just in English, but when we have a profound experience, like the one that I had in the chair that evening, it was very moving. I didn't actually like physically go anywhere, but it moved me. It moved my emotions, obviously. It moved my physicality. It moved me to weep, to release, to emotionally purge. It moved me physically by deeply deeply within just sobbing. That movement of sobbing, of releasing energy is such an important movement. Uh, folks in the trauma release world can talk to you about how that somatic wave that moves us, the one that we get when we're sobbing deeply, is so healing and so powerful. And then, of course, the spiritual movement that took place as a result of that evening was remarkable. The inspiration that found me, the creativity, that doesn't happen to me all the time. Poets will talk about how they have to chase a poem sometimes to pull in the words and, and write it down before it disappears. That inspiration that comes from the deep movement of music is the spiritual experience, or at least one aspect of it. This is much more than sitting still. This is much more than trying to calm things down. I have no problem with meditation. Meditation is lovely. But music is more of an active meditation. It is channeling every, everything, all the energy into a, into a space. It is letting go of the extraneous. That's music too. But with music, there's more of an invitation. Other than a quieting, it's an enlivening kind of quiet. It's a paradoxical thing, music. I would say, well, we can't meditate to music. That's it's too distracting. That's fine. That's, that's totally cool, right? But I think if you were to investigate your abilities more deeply, you might find that music would enliven your meditation in a way that you wouldn't normally experience. Oh, I know. You may not be doing it right. Uh, that's fine. I get that. But I'm just advocating for an experience here. And if it's one you want to take, then do that. So music itself actually moves in time. Like meditation, music takes time to accomplish. Unlike meditation, music guides you in an ineffable way. It's not somebody is telling you what to do and to sit still. It's you know all of those wonderful guided meditations that we can get online. It's not that at all. Music on its own provides the pathway and the journey. It sets the speed on which you get to take that journey. It offers you emotional richness along the way. It upregulates your system when it needs to. It downregulates your system when it needs to. It really gives you a full body experience of taking a satisfying journey, a satisfying movement through time. In fact, classical symphonies and other classical forms actually call their various bits 
of extended musical journeying movements. And there's a very defined structure that exists within those movements. And that structure, by the way, is very similar to the structure of a heroic journey. And that's on purpose because the ancient musicians, the really ancient musicians, were shamans and magicians. And their job was to take that heroic journey, sometimes on behalf of one person or a group of people, but to find, to excavate, to go deep into issues, problems, their own psyche, but to purposefully do the heroic work and then to recover the gold that was there and bring it back so that society could benefit. There's still cultures today where music is treated that way and where wise people in the culture are designated journeyers who do this work on behalf of the culture. You're probably familiar with some of them, and you're certainly familiar with the literature because this heroic journey motif or model exists in all of the great literature that's out there, all of the great film that's out there. And of course, in antiquity, in, in, in antiquity, it was a part of every single story. The Iliad, the Odyssey, the great myths. And it's not just Western culture. This heroic journey is common worldwide. There are certain cultures in the world, in West Africa, for example, today, where musicians are tasked with heroic jobs, uh, keeping the history of the tribe, keeping the history of the individuals in the tribe, maintaining that history so that if someone in the tribe falls ill and passes away, their life is reviewed by the musician responsible for having known it all and reviewed musically. The life story is accompanied by music. Some of you may know of the importance of music in the psychedelic journey. And I want to mention just one form of music that is common to ayahuasca journeys, which I had no idea existed. But as a sort of semi-proficient scholar of mythology, when I learned that the songs sung, sung by the curanderos or ayahuasca journeys are called Icaros, I immediately made the connection to Icarus, of course, and the myth of flying too close to the sun. But the fact that it's a song that accompanies the psychedelic journey, the ayahuasca journey, is significant to me because song is necessary on these journeys, these deep spiritual journeys. Song is a necessary component of that experience. I mentioned classical music before, which has always been set up as a journeying music. And some of the journeys can be short, let's face it. Some of them are much longer. Classical symphonies can you know, take an hour. Opera can take many hours. But the point is always the same. To tell the story in a way that can't be told without music. All of these stories are about movement, aren't they? They're all about getting up off the meditation bench. They're all about moving forward in a completely mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually aware way on a journey. A journey to where? Well, you have to trust your inner wisdom on that one. A journey to where you need to go. And believe me, we all need to go there. Science, technology, engineering, and medicine are not enough. For that journey, we need the arts as well. This heroic quest, and I don't want to take that too lightly, this shadow journey, this, it turns out, is a journey that all of us are equipped to take. In my own life, when I realized that I had been suppressing my need to take that journey, using medication, just stiff upper lipping it, suppressing or repressing all the emotions that were coming up. When I realized that I had what work I had done to keep myself from the heroic journey, 
it was shocking. It brought me alive in a way that I didn't realize I could be alive. And then came the realization that it's not just one heroic journey. That we're set up to be able to do heroic journeying many times. And like the research into post-traumatic growth, if we ignore the opportunity that trauma presents us, things don't go well. It's not great to keep all that trauma inside. I mentioned trauma release exercise earlier and the somatic wave. I've encountered so many healers and teachers who understand this and who spend a lifetime releasing trauma from their patients, from their clients. It's necessary. We've built up a huge, huge reservoir of tra trauma that must be let go of before we can do any more work. And there's a certain amount of letting go that has to take place, I think, before we can do a successful heroic journey on our own. Going into, for example, a psychedelic experience with too much in the tank, too much trauma in the tank, can result in a bad trip. And well, it ought to. Because if we haven't done the work to let go of some of that trauma, to process that trauma first, well, what's going to come up when we let go of our ego? Everything that's inside. I'd like to suggest for you that music, used with skill, is one way that we can consistently and reliably take those heroic journeys and release that trauma. The one that found me that night in the chair when I was feeling suicidal was a big one. But I've learned that I can take like many traumatic journeys all the time, and that I can do it in safety and with success. And what I'm beginning to understand is that this, this thing that we are, this mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual thing that we are, the being that we are, is really good at processing emotions, at digesting trauma, at embracing paradox. All those things that we were taught to, to shy away from, to stand back from, to avoid, all the times we were told to choose a side and make sure it's a good one, that's not the way. The way is way more inclusive than that, to use a word. And when we embrace that fully with a tool that lets us process it, amazing things happen. If that tool turns out to be music, which I believe that it may be, current understanding, for me, that's just a belief. There's no science around that yet. but. Given all the observation that I've been able to do, thousands of military veterans so far, hundreds and hundreds of people that I've had the chance to speak to, um, whoever has been online and seen these kinds of talks or watched podcasts, from the evidence that I can see, music is a powerful, powerful way to be able to take that journey. So this movement is all about empowering people to do that in safety with tools that work that are self-evident, and most importantly, that don't require someone else to give them to you, but that come from within you, right where you are right now, with your most powerful music that's already in your heart. So that's the why of Musomorphic. Now, let's talk about the how. So how do we use music? That's really the question, isn't it? The traditional ways, at least in the last few hundred years, are to have music lessons, for example. They get music lessons, like learn to play an instrument, right? Or learn to sing. Use your voice. Singers are so lucky they can take their voice with them anywhere they go. Of course, there's an economic downside to that. Our culture doesn't necessarily reward those who play instruments well or sing well. Uh, our culture rewards the experts, the ones who play instruments at a virtuosic level or who sing at an incredibly high level. Uh, it used to be that everyone, in fact, in America, there were more pianos than there were bathtubs. But everyone used to be able to be a musician at some level, to perform in some way. That was singing around the piano at home. And in the West, uh, 
the value of those kinds of experiences has diminished. And so the experts are the ones left to carry that ball. Still, if you want to get music lessons or voice lessons, please do. It's amazing to do that. And, and yes, definitely. On the other hand, you could engage in what we call recreational music making in the, the music therapy circles. RMM. So recreational music making is when you join a drum circle, for example, or you join a sing-along. Uh, these are intention, purposeful activities that are meant to uh, encourage a wider participation in the process of making music, even if it's drumming, right? That's a powerful thing, as we discussed earlier. Drumming is an amazing way to engage with music. Anything that puts the vibration of the music in connection with your physical being, uh, which is another reason that singers are so great because the vibration is right there in their head, right? But if you're playing a drum, you get the vibration in your hands. Or if you're if you're using mallets or if you're using your hands on a hand drum, you get it right in your fingertips and palms. Anything that puts that vibration up close to you is amazing. I, I lead a public sing-along and, and it's one of the most joyous experiences of my month, if we do one a month. If any of you have had the opportunity to be at a Bobby McFerrin concert or more recently a Jacob Collier concert, these guys have taken singing in public to the next level. And I mean, if you can go to a concert, great, but watch online. You can see some video from their performances. What Jacob does with, with public singing is amazing. He has people singing in harmony and he can direct them and they respond. It's, it's truly beautiful to watch that kind of public singing take place. Of course, anyone who's been to a concert for a, a tribute band or an old band is going to be able to sing all the songs. And I do love going to concerts where that happens. So that's recreational music making. Let's see, you can engage with music um, by listening. And this is one of those things we sort of outsourced to experts recently too. So uh, we've all read music critics. There are fewer and fewer of them all the time. But basically, especially if you're in a classical world, uh, you read the music critic to find out exactly what you're supposed to think about this, the concert that you heard. You know, you were there too, right? And then you can disagree with the critic or not, but they give you insight and, and technical expertise that it's not at everybody's fingertips these days. And that's true not only of classical music, but also of rock and roll. I mean, look at Rolling Stone. who has been doing this for a long time. Uh, you could engage with uh, musicology if you wanted to, do some deep research. There are incredible researchers out there right now. One of my favorite is Ted Joya. Ted is a, a jazz piano player, as a matter of fact, who has taken a deep dive into musicology and research. And he's writing in a beautiful book called Music to Raise the Dead that you can read on his Substack blog. Here's a Plug for Ted. You know, man, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, so you can engage with music on that level, a sort of an intellectual or historical level. And of course, you can engage with music on your own, listening to it and become an audiophile and a, you know, a curator of the Beatles hits. Uh, a recording studio that I love is run by a guy who's also a, a brews beer in his bathtub. Uh, an amazing guy. He has the Beatles wired inside out. He's listened to those albums so many times. And he listens to them through the equipment in his studio. So when he's not recording, you know, amazing musicians, he listens to the Beatles. And he is, uh, with respect to the Beatles, an audiophile. He really has internalized so much of what they do. And he can tell you chapter and verse on what's going on and why. And not just the nuances of the recordings themselves and the technical expertise, the recordings, but the music itself. And uh, you could talk to this guy and, and he would unpack the Beatles for you in a way that is truly profound. But we need to get beyond what the technical head brain can process here. In Musimorphic, it's about so much more than that. Our how is so much more than the typical music world allows today. See, so Musimorphic, we're about the way that we use music. We actually use music. What do you mean, Bill? Well, like music for working out, yeah, or music for running, music for relaxing, or music for just chilling, ambient music. You know, those are good uses of music. I get that. That's amazing. But when we're talking about using music here, it's much more than fight songs or the seventh inning stretch or worship. We're talking about like how to combine music with intention, for example. What would happen if you had an intention enlivened with music? or a set of intentions around a big ask or a big desire of, that were all connected to music. You had a playlist for your big ask that got you from the big ask to the end state. So this is a use of music that's out there, it's available right now. This is part of the way that we do it in Musimorphic. We can use music uh, as a communications tool to speak where words fail us. 
I talked before about love songs. A love song is a great way of being able to express something that you cannot say, even if there are no words to it. I'm thinking of Traumerei, the amazing Schumann melody, or um, Liebestrom by Liszt. These are, these are obvious love songs that say things in a way that words fail, right? So you can use music to speak where words can't. Now, this is especially true in memory care or in spiritual work. Uh, because many times with memory care patients, you can't talk to them. They don't understand, but you can make music with them or listen to music with them in a way that that creates a bond that wouldn't be there any other way. Musomorphic is also about rediscovering the ritual uses of music. And I mentioned, you know, fight songs and seventh inning stretch, worship music, of course, but I'm talking about bigger rituals than that. Um, one of them that's come uh, through my life many times is the heroic, the shadow journey, uh, the form of the shadow journey and the form of lots of music that's out there are the same form. Like it's the same thing, the musical journey and the shadow journey, the same thing. So music can inform the shadow journey used ritually in a very beautiful way. I use music often and teach the importance of using music to prepare for an event, a significant event. And we are all, of course, we're going to think of worship, we're going to think of weddings, uh, we're going to think of sports ball. Uh, but music before a significant event is a way of being able to open the space that nothing else can. And remember that music works on all four parts of us, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual. So the music that prepares for an important event opens us in all of those ways, in a way that mere words cannot, or a uh, moment of silence or whatever other ritual thing you're using, uh, does not. Music does. There's also a way to use music to recover from significant events. Oftentimes, the, uh, the, the content of an event can be so profound that there's no words for it, but music can help us bring that event in, to integrate that event in to our soul, to our being, in a way that mere intellectual processing, for example, does not. So by using music, we get the intellect, yes, but we also get the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual all together. That's a complete integration of significant events that's possible with music used ritually for that purpose. And then, of course, as many people are aware right now, uh, music can also provide transportation during an event. Uh, music during the psychedelic journey is something we mentioned earlier. Uh, there's many forms of uh, well, many kinds of opinions, I should say, about that right now. I've done some podcasting on that, but you might find that music is a way to give you the kind of transportation you need on a significant event or a significant journey that doesn't come any other way. One sort of non-ritual but very useful evidence of that is how we used to make mixtapes for one another or select songs for a cross-country drive that we'd play on the cassette player, the eight track, or even the CD player. These are the kinds of things that we do um, automatically that when elevated from, oh, let's have a, you know, let's put on the CD for our trip, but when elevated to the level of ritual, take on a whole new meaning and invite a whole new level of depth of experience into that meaning. One of the beautiful things about music that we can do in, in a more purposeful way is to use music to rediscover our relationships to be able to find the relationality between us that doesn't exist in any other way. If you've ever shared a song with someone and had them really understand, really empathize with you in that moment, you'll have some idea of the possibilities there. And doing this in a ritual way is one of the things that happens uh, when a band takes the stage. If we're on it, if we've done the work, our performance is actually the culmination of a ritual involving practicing, rehearsing, and all of that where we come together and find each other in a moment of time where the music that is shared is shared in a way that is transcendent, right? If we do that, that's the ritual use of music in relationality. You can see that if you're watching a band that's really on it, right? You can watch the members of the band and you know that they're in relationship when that's happening. If we do it well enough, the audience becomes a part of that too. But there are other aspects of music and relationality uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is one of them. Uh, social justice is another. There are ways of bringing music into connection with these problems that appear to be human social problems. Uh, that would be very beautiful if handled ritually. 
I'm using that word over and over, so I just I think about that, right? Think about the sacredness of what it means to find someone else whose opinions differ from yours in a moment of empathy where everything can change, in a moment where the paradox invites the spiritual solution. You don't have to take my word for this. A guy named Daryl Davis, who actually is a piano player, has uh, several TED Talks out there and has produced a number of uh, podcasts and interviews. While he is, in fact, a musician, it turns out that one of the, the sort of byproducts byproduct, of what he does is that KKK members who hear and interact with him wind up renouncing their KKK membership. And Daryl, at this moment, I think, has something like 22 or maybe it's 220 uh, clan robes in a wardrobe that he likes to bring around with him and give talks. And he opens the wardrobe and shows all these uh, clan robes that have been given to him. By clan members who renounce the practice. So uh, music is working in that way to open up the potential for relationship where one couldn't have existed between a black piano player and a white supremacist. Go, Daryl, we love you. So music used ritually is a great way of being able to uh, dissolve disagreement. Now, you say that's great, Bill, but there are clinical effects too. And, and I'd like to point out that the clinical effects of music are very important. Uh, music therapy is doing amazing work with memory care, of course, uh, amazing work with behavioral health care. Just this year, after something like 20 years, in 2022, I believe it was, music therapy was approved as a treatment for autism spectrum disorder. And that is powerful. My mom, who ran a piano studio for years, will tell you that kids with ADHD or hyperactivity, uh, always, always were able to focus with music, so much so that my college piano professor called my mom one day and said, how do you do that? You've got to tell me, Mrs. Protzman, what's, how are you doing this with kids? Show me how. So way before there were diagnoses, mom was doing this and music was the way forward. But those things are actually kind of like side effects. If we're using music on purpose, all the rest of it comes along. The IQ comes along. We have we have plenty of evidence of that now, that people who actually engage with music turn out to build their brains bigger and faster when they're little kids than people who don't. So uh, that's a wonderful side effect of using music, of music lessons specifically. The ritual use of music, though, for people like old folks like me, can also do things like release trauma. And you've heard my story about that. You don't have to take my word for it. There are lots of veterans and guitars for vets who can tell you about the release of trauma that comes from using a guitar self-care using music. There's so many uh, stories, of course, about physical results of using music, uh, music that releases headaches, um, specific frequencies that kill cancer cells. The research on this and the number of things that are physically wrong that can be corrected with music continues to grow. And it's really wonderful to know that with a purpose and an intent and a ritual, you can do these things. There's evidence, of course, that I mentioned behavioral health, but there's so much evidence of music as a healing modality out there. And I believe that when you're in the place of using music ritually, all of that just comes along with it. It's just part of the package that you get when you use music on purpose. Mental, emotional, physical, remember? And then, of course, spiritual or consciousness. So one of the important things that's necessary in our world these days is the elevation of consciousness. Uh, we're so bitter right now and so polarized, and that doesn't need to be. When you know someone on an emotional level and can empathize with that person on an emotional level, it's very difficult to hold anger and resentment for that person. And music is a way to invite that connection. How? Well, science will eventually tell us, but the current understanding is that by empathizing within music, you begin to share the emotional experience with one another. And that shared emotional experience, the way that it works for Daryl Davis, for example, is enough to open the crack in the door just enough to talk about what it's like to be human again, to be human together. So I know you're asking, how do I engage? I want to be part of this mesomorphic movement, Bill. What do I do? Well, um, my first answer is you keep on doing what you're doing. And then you learn how to do music with skill. Whatever that means. If you're a singer, you learn how to. All of these aspects come into play. And I'll cover the various different sort of 
you know, the big three that I've identified here is how you can do this. But the, the primary answer is you keep on doing what you're doing, and then you learn to enliven it with music. So if you're a musician out there, and particularly I'm talking now to the big names, to people with influence, to the Taylor Swifts of the world who can go on stage and bring an entire stadium along with them on their journey, to people like that, to people like Lizzo who's already doing it, I'd say start talking about music care. Start talking about the bigger purpose of music. Learn what the bigger purpose of music might be. Engage with me if there's something that you need to learn. I'm happy to teach and consult. But keep doing what you're doing. And maybe it's only 10 seconds in the middle of a three-hour performance where you say, you know what, this music thing, this can really heal and change you. That's the biggest thing that you can do if you're a musician with influence. If you're already making music or teaching it at some level, keep doing that. The world needs more of you. And trust that the way that people are talking about it and the interest that is generated in it by the people with big influence will start driving more customers your way. We'll start having more students to you if you're a teacher. We'll start driving more patients to you if you're a music therapist. We'll start driving interest in what music can do that hasn't existed in a long, long time. And what if you're in the audience? What if you're an audience member? As a listener, as a participant in the audience, you get to be there in the room when this magic happens. And if you understand the principles of what's going on, that will change your experience of music. If you know that the music you're hearing is working on you physically, and you can tap into what's happening to your heartbeat, to your breath, that'll change the way that you hear music. If you learn to tap into what's happening emotionally and develop an emotional language of richness that's more than just anger, sadness, joy, and fear, I think it was Dr. Brene Brown who found that most people can only, re- can only express in, in verbal lies, you know, in words, three emotions. And if her own research has discovered that there are 87 emotions and experiences, uh, that's 84 to go, people. We've got a little, little learning to do here. But change your language around music so that when you leave that concert, you can explain what happened to you on the emotional ride. And that richness, I promise you, just like learning to speak another language, will open up whole new possibilities where there weren't possibilities before. So learn the language of emotions if you're in the the audience. And then begin to teach those to other people. If you have family, teach them to your family. If you have kids, teach them to your kids. If you go to concerts with people, talk about the emotional experience afterwards. Try to open up your language to what happened there and, and really get specific about what what moments took place during the concert that really had meaning for you and describe them in ways more than just like, that was awesome. Describe them in ways that dive deep into the emotional content that was there. That's a beautiful way to engage if you're in the audience. And then the last group I want to talk about are organizations, organizations that may want to use music more skillfully. And that could be churches. It could be teams. But I'm thinking primarily of businesses where we have the most sort of angst right now. There's a need to coalesce in business again, to come together, to really be effective. How could we use music ritually to increase the effectiveness of our teams? And not just in terms of motivation and not just in terms of soft skills, but in terms of communication. Being able to communicate with music is one of the most beautiful things that's available in the ritual use of music that's not available in any other language. Because music communicates across all four of the domains, right? It communicates mentally, which we're often very good at doing with email, (laughs) probably a little too good, but with music, you get the emotional content, and then the real meaning of what you're saying comes through. You also get the physical content. And when we're talking about things like mirror neurons and all the stuff that science can measure right now, being in sync Being entrained with one another is possible with music. It doesn't take a motivational speaker or a team retreat. With music, you can be entrained the whole time. And then, of course, if you're doing anything that requires creativity, music is the gateway for creativity. That's part of the spiritual aspect of music. Also, 
it's part of the conflict that involved that is involved in digesting paradox that is part of music music sets up conflict it sets up tension and then it provides release and learning how to do that ritually will let you enter into a conflict or enter into a situation where there's contrast that needs to be there so the productive third way or whatever it might be can appear out of the polarization that exists music does that how do i fit in how do i help i don't want to be the leader of some giant worldwide movement i want the movement to be led corporately by everyone who's capable of leading in their own way if the principles can help enliven your movement and you want to learn what they are connect with me i can teach and i can consult with you as you engage those principles in whatever your milieu is in whatever your activity might be whether you're a musician an audience member or a team i can help my job is basically to help enliven your job with these amazing music principles that snap in to everything that happens Musomorphic is kind of an idea that holds it all together and rather than being a standalone movement competing with all the other movements my vision is that these ideas help enliven your movement and that together if we take musomorphic principles into all of the existing movements in the world new and old we can re-enliven their ability to to make change to make positive change in our world it really does snap into everything this amazing thousands of years old technology that we have called music and it's time that we learned that we can use it again as effectively as been used before i think with skill with skill if we really work together on this we can reinfluence the world musically and for good <laughs>